Okay, so uh, welcome everyone to the first colloquium of our spring semester at the Center for Global Ethics and Politics. We're very pleased to have you here for our exciting event. Um, we have, this is the first of four. Coming up will be uh, other speakers, including Eva Kate and um, let's see, Juliet Hooker and uh, Nicholas Rosales or it'll be uh, not quite in that order. So stay tuned for the invitations to those. They're really amazing uh, speakers. Today, we're featuring a kind of dialogue, panel, discussion, joint presentation by two uh, distinguished um, philosophers. Uh, and um, I wanted to just introduce them briefly. And then they'll present a joint PowerPoint um, and maybe make some additional comments. And then we'll have a discussion with a Q&A with the people here. So you'll have plenty of time to ask them your questions. So um, our speakers are Kristen Hessler, who's Associate Professor of Philosophy at the University of Albany, and who works in political philosophy and human rights theory, feminist philosophy, and environmental ethics and is currently working on a book on the very important topic of women's human rights. Um, and Andreas Folestal received his PhD in 1991 in philosophy from Harvard, where I think he was a raw student, is that right? Yes. Um, and he's now a professor of political philosophy on the faculty of law at the University of Oslo and co-director of Pluri Courts, a center of, of excellence for the study of the legitimate roles of the judiciary in the global order and was a principal investigator for the uh, European Research Council advanced grant multi-rights on the legitimacy of multi-level human rights judiciary. He's published in political philosophy, international political theory areas, globalization, Europeanization, whatever that is, <laughs> and human rights, sorry, and human rights and socially responsible investing if that's possible. So uh, I'm <laughs> just kidding. Um, so uh, we're really delighted uh, because uh, the um, idea behind this panel on, as you know, uh, uh, gender on the international bench um, arose because Kristen and Andreas are editing a special symposium on that theme for the Journal of Social Philosophy. And it seems to me in a very original and important question that hasn't been adequately discussed. So I'm really delighted to be able to feature them here at the center. Uh, so with that said, welcome. And I will let um, Kristen and Andreas take over with their po joint PowerPoint, which is a very nice uh, way to, to do this kind of thing, I think. Okay, thanks Kristen and Andreas for coming. Thank you so Thank you. much. I'm going to share my screen. Um, is everyone able to see this? Yeah, okay, great. great. Um, so thank you very much, um, Carol, for the invitation uh, to be here. Um, it's a pleasure. Um, it would be more fun in person, um, but <laughs> here we are from all corners um, and uh, joining together on Zoom instead. And I'm, uh, I wanted to say that uh, actually, the special issue itself was rooted in a conference that Andreas helped to organize in Oslo on the topic of gender on the international bench. I think that was back in 2017. Um, and um, so the whole project got its start in this very interdisciplinary um, gathering of scholars who brought together very different perspectives and questions and uh, skill sets and resources to try to address this question. So while Andreas and I are both philosophers, we're actually going to start out with an introduction that includes some of this um, background, <clears throat> um, both data and also um, the important kinds of questions um, about this issue. <clears throat> Excuse me. Hold on one second, sorry. Okay, so as you can see from the outline, um, we're going to start by setting out some of the parameters of our discussions, um, walk through a little bit of what we know um, already, and then um, get into a little more depth on how we got here, 
uh, what's at stake um, in terms of the normative questions um, about this issues. And then um, we'll each uh, address our own contributions to this question about um, representation of um, um, sex representation on international courts. Um, so uh, Andreas is going to talk through the question, uh, what should be done from the perspective of um, a range of uh, targets for representation of women on international courts. And then I'm going to um, slightly uh, change the topic a tiny bit and talk about um, the issue of gender justice in a substantive way um, as it comes before international courts. <clears throat> I'm gonna invite Andreas to jump in as I go through the introductory section um, uh, as needed, um, but I'll, I'll just be walking through this first set of slides primarily. <clears throat> uh, so some of the parameters for our discussion, we're going to be focusing uh, provisionally speaking on the two most common genders, approximately equally represented. Um, and we wanna at the same time, make sure that uh, we're having a conversation in a way that is not essentialist. Um, and I'm just using Trina Grillo's uh, account of essentialism here, but we don't want to end up with arguments that presume essentialism. Um, and we're not wanting to fall prey to the idea that elite international judges, say if uh, we have female judges on international courts that um, they can in some legitimate way represent the interests of women as a class, especially uh, globally speaking or for however um, wide the range is of the um, interest group that the court serves. <clears throat> we also are avoiding um, the slippery slope towards arguments that we um, might end up committed to the idea that uh, international benches should somehow mirror existing um, population demographics. <clears throat> so this, this is a, just a very brief set of parameters that we're setting for our conversations and we hope you'll call us on it if you think that we've um, violated um, any of these parameters um, in our arguments or presentation. <clears throat> um, and another one is that we want to recognize intersectionality. So anti-essentialism and intersectionality are sometimes described obviously as two sides of the same coin or coming um, to the same point from different directions. Um, but we also wanna just represent that there are multiple facets of identity that are cross-cutting, interlocking, and all of which have implications for um, questions of um, both representation um, and the impacts of decisions, politics on people's real lives. And so this is obviously a multiple level of um, intersectionality and a number of them are particularly relevant for international courts in particular. So for example, um, global north south representation um, in addition to other um, demographic descriptors, <clears throat> um, legal tradition as well. Um, and this, these are questions that um, more and more international courts are dealing with on a more uh, explicit basis as it comes up uh, as an issue of representation among judges <clears throat> and on and on. So we're, we're, again, this is just uh, trying to lay out the parameters we wanna take seriously, both anti-essentialism and intersectionality in all of these senses. <clears throat> um, so getting started with, uh, a little bit of the data about what we know. And so what I've done here is just to reproduce um, a table from Yanke Grossman's um, 2016 paper. Uh, Grossman started working on this question um, and really was um, responsible for bringing the question of the paucity of women judges on international courts into the international legal literature starting in around um, 2011, so approximately 10 years ago. Um, and this was this data reflects um, the status of women on international courts in mid 2015, as you can see from the second uh, column on this table. Um, and as you can see, um, the representation of women as judges on international courts is relatively low. Um, and there's just a couple of other things I wanted to point out. Um, that middle column of a representation requirement, um, a lot of them 
Um, the answer is no. So there is no explicit requirement that um, there are threshold uh, numbers of um, women and men as judges on the courts, even in places where the answer is yes. Um, the uh, qualification is that um, this is in some cases just aspirational. So the exception is the European Court of Human Rights, the bottom row on this table. Um, it was aspiration up until 2003 and virtually mandatory since 2004, um, and yet um, still falling short of their own um, representation requirement. <clears throat> um, and the next uh, slide is uh, just the rest of this table. Uh, and one thing I also want to point out about this table is that it conveys a wide variety of topics covered by international courts. So we've got human rights courts, we've got the International Criminal Court, we've got the International Tribunal for the Law of the Sea, um, you've got the ad hoc uh, international criminal tribunals for the former Yugoslavia and Rwanda. Um, so there's a wide range of um, subject matters. The nature of courts is different. Some are ad hoc and temporary, um, some are more permanent. Um, and the ages of these courts are, um, are different as well. So um, ICJ, the International Court of Justice, um, was um, established in uh, 1946. I'm going to back up to this previous slide. Um, and the most recent one on this uh, table was established in 2006, and that's the African Court on Human and People's Rights. <clears throat> um, this is just a little update that I put together since that table was compiled based on 2015 data. Um, as you can see, the African Court on Human and People's Rights, which I would just pointed out was the most recent, um, most recently established court on that table, um, that has reached parity, uh, six out of 11 judges um, since 2018. So the fact that they reached parity in 2018 wasn't reflected on that table, because again, that was from 2015 data. Um, and I think it's interesting that um, that's the only court uh, that I know of, the international court that has reached parity of uh, male and female judges, and that's the most uh, recently established court. Um, unchanged, so a couple of them are unchanged since that 2015 data. Um, so the International Court of Justice, again, which was the oldest court on that table, stayed at three out of 15 judges, three women out of a total of 15. The Inter-American Court of Human Rights stayed at uh, one out of seven. There's been a kind of interesting but slow trajectory towards progress on uh, the International Tribunal for the Law of the Sea. Um, zero in 2012, one, in, one woman in 2015, um, and five now in 2021. But as of last, I think, October, there were only three. So there were two um, recent appointments of women to that uh, bench. Um, and then the International Criminal Court, which seems to be on a slow and steady uh, regress here. Um, so at parity in 2011, um, seven women out of 19 judges in 2015, um, and down to six um, out of 18 in 2021. Um, I think Andreas and I, when we get to our more substantive arguments, uh, we both refer to this data. So I want to talk through this really briefly. As Nienke Grossman was um, pointing out, um, as long as 10 years ago, it's hard to find data on how women judge, whether there are substantive differences um, based on the sex of judges, based on the outcomes and the decisions um, that they make in international courts, precisely because there are so few women on international courts. Sorry, Andreas, did you wanna? Uh, it, is the slide, are the slides moving? I've been advancing them. Are they not advancing for you? Not for me, but that might just be my computer. Yeah, just you. <laughs> okay. <laughs> uh, where, which slide are you on? Um, I'm on table one. So, okay, so what on earth is going on? Anyway, so then if, if it's me, that's the problem, then just continue. <laughs> yeah, we're on sex differences in judging at the time. Exactly. Okay, good. I'm also there. Okay. Uh, so you're seeing most data is from domestic courts, Carol and yes, Patricia, yes. but not Andreas. Okay, but Andreas has his own copy. So Andreas, I'll just, <laughs> yeah, we're on, yeah, the sex differences been, in judging the um, Boyd et al. Uh, citation at the bottom. Okay. Um, so um, what do we do? We don't have a lot of uh, data on how 
women judges uh, decide cases in international courts. So we want to <laughs> uh, gesture towards um, provisional data that we have from uh, sex differences in judging from domestic courts. And I think both Andreas and I and our substantive arguments refer to um, both of these papers. So I wanted to just talk through these findings um, very briefly, and we'll come back to them um, later in our presentation. Um, so based on a 2010 study of sex differences in judging, um, this is from uh, US courts, um, there was a systematic study um, that was uh, innovating in the direction of um, a better methodology for studying sex differences in um, judicial decision making. And they studied uh, 13 areas of law and found consistent effects of the sex of a judge on uh, their decisions in exactly one area, and that was sex discrimination. <clears throat> um, and that those uh, 13 areas, one of the other ones was um, sexual harassment, and they didn't find a gender difference there. Um, but more uh, uh, sort of, or I guess in addition, um, the same study found an additional what they call panel effect. So there are differences in how men and women judge um, in um, the area of sex discrimination, but also regarding sex discrimination cases, they found that um, the presence of a woman judge on a bench influenced how their male colleagues voted um, or decided particular cases. Um, and uh, a separate study in 2015 backed up, uh, sorry, 2005 um, had shown that as well. So they also, that study indicated that over time, the greater number of sexual harassment cases that any particular male judge had decided with a woman judge on the bench, the more likely that male judge was to rule in favor of the plaintiff in sexual harassment cases. So this is a limited data pool, and it's again from domestic courts, not international courts. But what data we have doesn't seem to show a lot of differences in terms of substantive decisions judges make based on their sex except for possibly in this one area of sex discrimination, um, but also there are these panel effects uh, where sitting uh, male judges making decisions on a bench with uh, female colleagues um, tends to have an effect on how the male judges vote or decide their cases. <clears throat> Really quickly, I want to talk through this limited pool hypothesis um, because you might have that in your head, <laughs> um, but Grossman um, in her 2016 paper um, went through a lot of data, making some predictions uh, that you might expect to be true if it were the case that the paucity of women judges on international courts were rooted in the scarcity of qualified women um, to be nominated or selected for those positions. Um, and so these four smaller bullet points here are each predictions that you might expect to be true if the limited pool hypothesis was the correct explanation or at least the primary cause um, of the scarcity of uh, women judges on ICs. So the idea would be, well, as the percentage of women in the pipeline, as it were, increases, you'd also expect to see, perhaps with some time lag, um, the percentage of um, women sitting on international courts increase. Also, as you saw from my presentation of the data, it doesn't seem like that is happening. Um, courts with similar subject matter might um, have similar percentages of representation of women States in which you have a higher percentage of women judges and lawyers might have a higher percentage of women judges uh, represented on international courts. And we'd also expect to see that there's a strong, um, strongly meritocratic appointment process for ICs in general. Um, and she points out that none of these are in fact the case, right? We don't see the data working out in the way that these first three bullet points suggest that we should. And regarding the last one, the meritocratic process, I'm going to talk about that um, really briefly on the next slide. Um, she points out that actually a lot of these um, appointment processes are fairly notoriously non-meritocratic, um, to put it mildly. So you've got all sorts of political considerations, um, horse trading among states where one state will agree to back uh, another state's nominee for a particular judgeship uh, in exchange for support on other decisions. Um, and she points to, in particular, the lack of um, judicial experience 
um, and even any <laughs> criminal judicial experience uh, amongst judges on, these are the international criminal tribunals for the former Yugoslavia and for Rwanda. And these just, you know, hand-waving a little bit at some facts about the selection process for international judgeships, um, she thinks shows um, that that last um, hypothesis about um, a strongly meritocratic process of selection and nomination for international court judges uh, doesn't turn out to be the case. Um, really briefly, I think Andreas, if he wants to jump in, can talk a little bit more about this, but there's these notorious incidents where um, the nomination process, as I mentioned earlier, for the European Court of Human Rights requires um, a representation uh, of women judges. Um, and Malta in 2004 and 2006 and Belgium in 2012 um, put up a panel of nominations with no women on them, despite the, the requirement. Um, and when they were pressed on it, they said there weren't any um, women that were qualified that they could nominate. And other people, you know, some observers pointed out they don't even, they're not even constricted to nominating their own citizens. And yet the, they were reaching for this limited pool hypothesis. Um, and there was a relatively recent arrival um, and only in a few courts of uh, um, gender requirements um, in international court nominations. Um, so there's a lot of issues with the nomination and selection process um, that are surely among the causes of the scarcity of women judges in international courts. Um, and we'll come back to some of those issues as we go along. Um, so very quickly, I'm just going to um, throw these questions up here because these are some of the ones that we're going to turn to um, when we turn to our substantive arguments. So on one hand, we might ask, so what are the arguments um, that um, the process uh, leading to the scarcity of women judges on international courts, um, wh where do they tell us to go? Um, how many um, women should we be expecting to see if processes were working justly? Um, can we make arguments that conform to the parameters we set out at the beginning of our presentation um, and that can withstand some commonly heard objections uh, to calls to reduce gender inequality. Um, and we wanna also talk about um, the issues of normative legitimacy um, for courts and how that might be impacted um, by gender imbalance among judges. Very quickly, I'm sorry, I'm just gonna look in the chat. I see that there's something there, but I'm not sure, okay. I think we can come back to that. Um, really quickly, uh, normative legitimacy, I'm just gonna talk through um, very briefly. Um, so the way I'm understanding normative legitimacy um, here is the right of a political institution to issue authoritative decisions within a defined purview. It's a lower standard than full justice. Um, and that's part of the point, I think. So the standard of normative legitimacy um, becomes a relevant standard of assessment for political institutions um, due to considerations of stability, when we want to make sure that um, those institutions retain their authority even when it's impossible or just simply unlikely that they're gonna be able to perform perfectly at all times. Um, but also in cases where there's disagreement about exactly what full justice requires. And I think that second case ends up being especially important for courts um, who are often called in precisely when <laughs> the issue of what justice requires is either indeterminate or um, a subject of disagreement. Um, and I just also wanna emphasize that it's a threshold concept, right? So um, below us, the, the point of normative legitimacy is to say, well, there is some <laughs> threshold of functioning um, below which an institution can lose its um, legitimacy, but there's some room for imperfection <laughs> um, in how an institution functions um, before we, we call it illegitimate. Um, and then just briefly gesture towards uh, the fact that both processes uh, of particular institutions, how well they observe considerations of procedural fairness, for example, for courts, um, as well as their outcomes might be relevant to assessing their normative legitimacy. And so, um, Andreas, I know this is a tiny bit like one slide ahead of um, where I'm scheduled to um, um, hand this over to you. Um, but I just wanted to um, indicate that um, these are also um, 
particular features of international courts and just invite Andreas if he wants to step in here also um, that are relevant um, to international courts um, and an assessment of their legitimacy and the issues that might be raised for um, their normative legitimacy um, based on uh, scarcity of women judges. So there's this, again, this idea of substantive and procedural fairness, um, but for international courts um, that are often um, functioning in environments where um, they have to almost meet a higher standard uh, of legitimacy in order to be considered legitimate um, by their deference constituencies because they're functioning in this international environment, um, there are, might be special considerations for international courts in particular. Um, and so both in terms of substantive fairness, um, like being responsive to gender justice, um, but also the idea that international courts uh, play a role in not just interpreting, but often developing in the sense of even making international law itself. Um, there's a significant burden of um, showing that they are legitimate and that they deserve their um, political authority. Um, and I'm not hearing from Andreas to jump in, so I'll turn this over, Andreas, to you now. Good. So thanks. This was uh, so this gives us the sort of background for for why this is a, an important issue, and then uh, Kristen and I have been working uh, with the with the grateful invitation from Carol to to write up papers on some of these topics more in depth, and so that's where we will start now. And so uh, my contribution in the journal and uh, here is to look more closely at what exactly is it that. What does justice require with regards to the number or proportion of women judges on international courts? Does it, and so um, if we go to the next slide, we can see, we can imagine someone saying we need 50% of both uh, of the dominant genders. Um, that would be one position. Uh, but there are other positions that are also. Uh, it turns out important to keep in mind when we look at the various arguments for more women on the bench. And one would be simply, we need a token, at least uh, for some purposes, people would say, well, at least one uh, would be enough, or at least one would be good, or a critical mass uh, drawing on issues of, of group dynamics. People are talking about 15 to 25% of the bench so that the, the discussions will somehow bring forth enough women perspectives, and we'll get back to that interesting term. And then a, th a further is, uh, position would be, well, we need a parity zone. We need at least 40% of both of the dominant genders for a variety of reasons. So these are four different sort of p uh, views about what justice require regarding uh, gender. And I'm going to argue for something like a parity zone of both genders. Um, and the way I do that is by looking at the various arguments uh, that Christian hinted at um, in, the, in the overview and look at what, if, the, if they empirically hold up, what are the implications regarding the composition of the international bench? So the question then is how many female judges do we need? Um, and um, I want to here just go quickly through three different mechanisms that are often appealed to when explaining why the current imbalance is unacceptable. And these, I think, have different implications with regards to where on the scale of how many women uh, judges are appropriate on the international bench. So the first argument we might see regard as, as one of compassion. So the judge has to be able and committed to be concerned with the experiences of others, not empathy in the sense of emotional experience necessarily, but the ability and willingness, preparedness to, to take on the views and the concerns of, of other individuals. Now, so from that point of view, I think it's very important to, to keep in mind this, this concern that Krishna flagged early. Um, is there any reason to believe that this very select elite set of female international judges are more likely than the elite male 
colleagues to have this ability and commitment to be concerned with others circumstance and experiences uh, for this wide range of parties to the dispute um, and are, will they be more likely to identify with have compassion with the women um, in and the plight of women in these cases and again if we extrapolate from the domestic findings that Christian uh, sketched there is some statistical likelihood to believe that so that would support the view that we need it would be beneficial to get the whole picture that the judges need to take in, take on board uh, to have some female international judges uh, not necessarily 50 percent but that some uh, female international judges will help bring to the attention of the court um the, the circumstances and the interests of, of women so the second sort of mechanism is is the value of uh, of deliberation um where we would want the judges to have as much uh, as broad access to the facts that are relevant and to the relevant legal norms that can be brought to bear on this particular case um and that that is that that need epistemic need benefits from having both genders on the bench um and then of course given the historical suppression of women populations of the global south um uh, different ethnic backgrounds um concerning the development of international law in general that makes it even more important we would argue that that women should be included now for this epistemic argument to hold we we don't need to say or we don't need to hold that that um these women judges are more likely to pick up on somehow women sensitive perspectives however we want to define that um there might be uh, some evidence that women are more likely to pick up what we might regard as feminist aspects and Kristen will be coming back to define and discussing the feminism uh, at stake here somewhat more, more often than men um, so that would support a sort of critical mass uh, a ma number of women um, and also and this, this picks up on one of the other points mentioned before the gender of the judge seems to have a significant and independent effect so that the fact that male judges have been sitting on a bench with women judges before affects in part their epistemic awareness of the issues at stake for in future cases so that's um, a value of its own but here it seems that critical mass is not sufficient if we want to pick up as many different aspects as are relevant uh, then our concern about intersectionality would say, well, there are many relevant perspectives. It's not a one, it's not simply the woman, the women's perspective. There are so many different aspects that might be highly appropriate to bring in to the legal deliberations beyond the one woman uh, perspective so from this point of view we need several different perspectives and so that we suggest or at least i suggest um uh, would be an argument in favor of more than a, a critical mass but more of at least 40 percent to 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 try to enhance the the range of, of relevant perspectives and the third argument is one we might think of as status inequality so that if we if we see when we see this drastic gender inequality on almost all international benches this is a public expression of status inequality this is this is stating that women are not able or appropriately able to function as international judges um, and it cannot simply be dismissed as an unintentional effect that that, that reasonable people should be expected to overlook. Um, and it, that's because in particular, these are public positions and these are filled by procedures that allege that they are at least in part meritocratic, right? And then empirical findings suggest that there might be some other considerations as well. Um, and some of those are arguably appropriate, 
that they want uh, mem members on the of the bench on the bench with from different legal traditions um, and so forth. But the inequality that we see on the bench with regards to women occurs in, within a backdrop of societies with very long, horrible histories of oppressing the equal status of women. It becomes very implausible to hold in those settings that this inequality has just come about by accident, that this has nothing, that there, there, aren't, that there aren't institutional mechanisms that actually foster uh, this sort of inequality. We're not a, we don't need to claim that this is an intentionally masochistic, um, women-hating um, institution-making policy, but it's, it's so clearly a, a, an expression of a general problem of gender in these societies that it, it should not be dismissed as an unintentional, an unintentional effect that we, for that reason, can overlook. Because responsible actors are choosing not to do anything about this. Um, now, again, we, I don't think the concern about status equality requires complete gender parity, but it certainly will require a significant proportion of both genders, enough to reduce the suspicion that there, there are these express systemic uh, roots of, in, of, um, of oppression that are, that are behind that. There are other important concerns as well, as well as gender that, that also need to be uh, encompassed, the, um, the geographical um, background, uh, the different legal traditions uh, and so forth. So, but it, so insisting on exactly 50% will might might be unworkable. But it's um, it's still a strong argument in favor of drastic reduction of the present inequality. So uh, those arguments, I suggest, in that provide strong support for claiming that we need parity uh, in uh, men and women to be in the parity zone on these international courts. Now, so then to conclude this section, we can go back and look uh, at the, the objections uh, that we uh, that we wanted to avoid. So, but so far, I'm suggesting it's difficult to see arguments that require a strict numerical gender equality parity. But there are several very strong arguments to support a parity zone of, of male and female judges, uh, with, but with also with a diversity of backgrounds and sensitivities. So not all, please, not all the judges from the same uh, alma mater, not all from the same geographical uh, or economic background and so on. Um, so this is assuming that some of the empirics uh, that Kirsten sketched through from studies of domestic courts also hold for international courts. So it seems that strict numerical gender equality is not uh, supported by these sorts of arguments, but, but a parity zone uh, uh, requirement seems, seems appropriate. So let's look at some of the objections uh, quite quickly. One might say uh, against this that there's an assumption here that that women are more empathic, that they have more epistemic uh, advantages um, to capture the plight of women than men do. Um, we are not assuming this. I'm not claiming um, that uh, this will be the case. To the contrary, we these are the candidates for these these positions are extremely elite segments of the population and there might be reasons to, to say we should we should want that they're self-selected for legal training um, they're socialized into uh, the legal profession and the judicial profession uh, they come often from a, um, a privileged economic background so there are biases um, in the selection process that makes it unlikely to to believe that this these women are in are particularly likely to identify with the, the broad range of women um, affected by uh, these courts. Um, in response, uh, we are not saying, or I'm not saying that this, that there will be this automatic identification. I'm only arguing that having more female judges 
reduces the risk of bias and reduces the lack of relevant perspectives and arguments, both among the women judges and among the male judges. So the, these argument, this argument for uh, gender uh, in, uh, parity zone is not claiming that biases will disappear, but the likelihood that they will occur uh, is reduced. This next argument um, objection might be that female judges uh, can't, we can't expect that female judges would always be supporting women's interests. And again, there's no claim on these along these uh, in these arguments um, that any judge is particularly strongly in favor of of whichever sections of the population that each of them somehow represent. Um, and it's not assuming that there are particular women's issues that can be identified uncontroversially. It's, it's a quagmire to try to figure out what, what would count as, as particularly women's issues when we particularly look globally. Um, and certainly that there's no one unique, correct feminist response that we can, that we're assuming that female international judges are likely to identify and uphold. Um, so that's a, that's a, uh, the argument is much, uh, um, much more modest that there is a, a there's a risk there is a we, we want to re, be reducing the risks of this and then the final objection is that this will if we if we insist that women need to be represented we will end up with again taking intersectionality on board we will need uh, so many different requirements to ensure correct representation that this will be un completely unworkable and completely um, unrealistic. Um, but again, uh, the, the claims that I'm supporting is not saying we need 50% representation or we need somehow mirror representation. It is only supporting a parity zone. And again, the argument in favor of women's representation does not hold for all different sort of categories of populations. It supports inclusion of some segments of the populations, namely those that historically have suffered uh, patterns of inequality of status that have influenced most likely the norms, the practices, the, the procedures of these courts, um, the, the rules that maintain um, injustice domestically and internationally, um, and those whose perspectives we would get more legal norms brought in epistemically uh, to the deliberations by including them. And so it's not that we're not opening the floodgates to have all groups, however defined, uh, represented in a mirror way on this. Uh, but there are some that we, and some of these groups, of course, we uh, slowly discover uh, bring important perspectives to bear, uh, but there are some that, uh, that fit these categories, uh, ethnicities, uh, persons with disabilities, um, uh, different gender identifications, geographic concerns, um, and also arguably that we need to be wary to not have all the uh, all of these judges come out of certain uh, high, pres high, high prestige um, uh, universities uh, in the West. So the conclusion that I want to draw here is that um, when we look at the effects of these courts, both the judgments that they make and the important interpretation and development of international law, um, I'm, we're saying, I'm saying that the processes need to be fair, the mechanisms um, that we are relying on um, are showing, we say, that um, both genders should be in the parity zone when it comes to these courts. Um, if the empirical evidence actually supports that some of these some of these mechanisms that, that I've indicated, um, but there's no there's strong arguments. I don't see them at least for complete equal proportions of, of men and women. Um, but many of these arguments are uh, supporting the point that many judges should be more gender sensitive in various senses of this word, regardless of their own sex and gender. Um, you know, for the epistemic reasons, for the, for the uh, concerns about sympathy and, and for equal status. 
And so from that point of view, there should be more formal requirements, it seems, on the composition of the, of the court. Um, and as, as Kristen mentioned, it does seem that to have nomination requirements, for instance, regarding gender on these courts, does seem to help the imbalance. So some strict requirements um, do seem to have an impact, even though uh, there are some of these infamous cases of, of uh, small uh, European countries that that uh, that show that, it, that they, these rules are broken sometimes. So that's over to you, Kristen. Thank you. Um, I know um, we're coming up on the uh, a lot of time for our presentation. We want to leave a lot of time for discussion. So I'm going to move a little bit quickly through my argument, and we can always come back to some of these issues um, during the discussion. <clears throat> but I wanted to a few more minutes if you want. Okay. Don't worry about it. You can take a few more minutes. Yeah. Okay, great. Um, my argument, because I'm picking up on the idea of gender sensitivity that Andreas um, finished with as one of his closing thoughts, I wanted to say that um, before going in that direction, I'm going there, um, but already on the basis of uh, having accepted uh, a lot of the arguments that um, however we got here and for uh, many reasons, I think the case for increasing the number of women judges intentionally and consciously uh, on international courts is basically overdetermined. There are a number of convincing lines of argument, um, any of which taken on their own um, would get you to there. Um, but I wanted to think a little bit more deeply about the issue of normative legitimacy, partly because this is a question that has been um, talked about in the literature. Um, and one of the arguments that I'll be responding to is that the normative legitimacy of international courts is themselves at stake uh, when we have radical inequality of sex representation among judges. Um, and I'm going to argue eventually <laughs> uh, that um, the issue of normative legitimacy, as I was describing it earlier, understood as the right of courts to make authoritative, authoritative decisions within their purview, is more plausibly connected not to the sex of judges, um, but to their responsiveness to issues of gender justice, what Andreas was just um, calling um, gen gender sensitivity. Um, but then I'll also um, consider, I think uh, one of the issues that was raised already in chat on this Zoom, um, explicitly this idea of responding to the objection that um, feminist judging seems like biased uh, judging because not impartial. Um, and I'm going to borrow some arguments from feminist philosophy of science to respond to um, that objection. <clears throat> Um, so very quickly, um, the, I just wanted to point out that the last bullet point here, starting however, right, this is not what available evidence suggests. I'm just starting there because you saw that already on one of our introductory slides. So this is a crowded slide, but partly I'm just reproducing some of the data um, that I presented back at the introductory section of our talk. Um, and that's pointing out again that um, consistent, gen consistent gendered effects uh, in judicial decision making out of 13 areas of law were only found in one and that is sex discrimination and then also explaining the panel effects um, at the same time. But I wanted to start this slide and consider that data in light of this argument that, for example, Nienke Grossman is not the only one who has made this argument, um, but she's arguing that, look, we might expect to find these um, gendered differences in judging. and. If we do see widespread gendered differences in judging, um, then an unbiased bench will necessarily be a sex balanced um, bench because we can expect these gendered effects um, to have an impact and influence on a wide range of judicial decisions. Um, and so if we're aiming for a kind of impartiality, we need equal representation um, of each gender. <clears throat> Um, 
that would be an example of gender differences um, where neither approach, right? So if we found such differences in judging, neither approach would be inherently better or worse. The argument for normative legitimacy would just be um, that both um, perspectives are required. But again, going back to the evidence um, that we discussed from domestic courts, if we're allowed to in, um, interpret that as relevant to international courts also, we don't find such um, differences um, across the board in a wide range of cases, but rather only in cases that do seem to have an element of gender justice um, to them. Um, and so it seems like this uh, difference in judging based on the sex of judges is specific to issues of gender justice when they come before the court. <clears throat> and so I wanted to really briefly consider um, different hypotheses about why we might see um, gender ju uh, differences in, ju in judging. Um, one, the different voice account, right? That obviously is borrowing Carol Gilligan's terminology, right? That would be a sort of broadly gendered framework, right? This idea that there's something about gender, um, maybe not specifying nature or nurture, but some combination thereof, such that men and women bring sort of widely different um, worldviews and perspectives to the bench. There we'd expect differences across a wide range of decisions. The representational account, is where we might end up um, in a slippery slope as Andreas was talking about, where this idea is that women represent women as a class. Again, we might expect differences on a wide range of um, areas there, or at least uh, in areas that um, affect women's interests if we can identify those. But the informational account is different. It just says maybe women are bringing specific information or expertise um, or perspectives um, that male judges tend not to bring. So it's not about who they are, it's about what they know or are sensitive to. So importantly, it's only of these three, only the informational account really allows you to predict that whatever it is that women are bringing could be shared with men, right? Where we would expect these panel effects um, due to the fact that the information or perspective is something shareable by women um, in deliberations with their male colleagues. So the informational account is what seems to be supported here as the explanation for the um, gender differences in judging that we do in fact see. And the last bullet point here is um, just picking up on some of the examples from the literature where um, both of these cases are discussed by Grossman, for example, as examples where she thought we see gendered differences in judging. Um, and I'm pointing out that these examples are themselves uh, cases where there is a substantial component of gender justice involved. So the Akiezu case before the International Criminal Tribunal um, for Rwanda um, was um, it, a genocide case, of course, um, but it involved um, the first decision um, that was a conviction for rape as a component of genocide. And in Grossman's telling, uh, Judge Pillay's questioning of witnesses was especially instrumental in bringing um, evidence of sexual violence during the genocide to light. Um, the prosecutors and investigators um, had not um, turned this up and this was not on the um, original indictment of Akeizu. Um, and another case that uh, Grossman talks about involves um, a woman judge reporting that she had to convince her colleagues um, that a woman did not consent to um, this heinous sexual assault. So both of those cases are cases um, clearly where there's a distinct um, component of um, sexual violence and gender justice. So if this is right, I want to say that this is not the kind of gender differences in judging where neither male perspectives nor female perspectives are any better than the other. Rather, these seem to be issues of sort of objectively good judging <laughs> requires that we respond to the issues of justice in front of us. Um, and that if judges are failing to be responsive to issues of gender justice in particular, um, I'm gonna go out on a limb and say, right, that's, that's just, um, a case of failing to respond to considerations um, in the case that ought to be responded to. So if we're responding to those kinds of cases by saying what we need is more women on the bench, I have a few worries about um, that 
line of argument. And again, I just want to flag that I buy lots of other arguments for why there are independent reasons um, to increase the number of women on international courts, uh, including the status and equality arguments that um, Andreas was talking about. But if we're saying that we need more women in order to be, have courts be sensitive to issues of gender justice, um, we might worry that that lets male judges off the hook um, for being insensitive uh, to issues of gender justice. Uh, I think that might run the risk of turning issues of gender justice into sort of just women's concerns, um, as if those are not actual human rights issues um, that ought to be taken seriously. Um, it also, I'm gonna come, just skip this. We can come back to the third bullet point if we want, but that last bullet point about systemic ways in which the content of law might be biased against women. Um, uh, there might be within the law itself legal definitions and evidentiary requirements regarding rape, for example, that are elements of how judges are approaching a case um, that might get disappeared if what we're focusing on is we need more women in benches uh, and we're not looking at um, revisions that need to be made in prosecutorial standards, um, evidentiary standards and things like that um, that are biased against women um, who are coming before the court. <clears throat> Okay, um, I'm going to go through this really quickly. I think we can come back to it as well. I think for these kinds of cases, we obviously don't need a, a highly specified account of what gender justice requires. And I here want to gesture explicitly toward the idea that, of course, um, people are going to disagree. Feminists are going to disagree about what feminism requires in any particular field. Um, and so I don't want to be suggesting that um, there's one specific <laughs> feminist perspective or that gender justice is just one thing and everybody needs to uh, get in line and agree with that. But um, if we assume that uh, responsiveness to gender justice will include just two basic things, right? A kind of disposition to critically assess even widespread practices, assumptions, and beliefs because they may contribute to the social, uh, the social or political subordination of women. And then a commitment to ending that kind of subordination, right? which is all I mean here by a commitment to social and political equality. So if we just assume that sort of bare minimalist conception of feminist um, uh, justice or gender justice, my provisional conclusion is that the internal logic of normative legitimacy as well as the goals of gender justice are more plausibly advanced by the presence of feminist judges rather than women judges. Um, and I'm saying all that and we're, uh, Carol, should I leave this argument aside about judicial no. neutrality? I, I, I'm interested. I, I, okay, I'll go through really quickly. So here's the question, right? Is this legitimate? <laughs> so if I'm saying um, uh, legitimacy, uh, sorry, the presence of feminist judges may contribute to normative legitimacy, um, we might expect uh, a backlash on that because that sounds like um, if feminists are specifically bringing feminist values and dispositions, um, that might sound like um, recommending impartial judging. Um, and there is this um, well-known case uh, where a defendant before the International Criminal Tribunal for the um, former Yugoslavia objected um, to Judge Mumba's being on uh, the trial court um, because Judge Mumba was part of the UN Commission on the Status of Women. And this, the defendant used this as an argument to say <laughs> this person's biased <laughs> um, towards women. The defendant was a defendant in sexual violence case. Um, <laughs> that, was, that was overcome, but it wasn't just the defendant who was making this argument. So Janet Haley, a legal scholar, um, was very critical of the response um, of the um, International Criminal Court to say that, look, we find Judge Mumba's membership on the um, UN Commission on the Status of Women to be a qualification for sitting on this bench. And Janet Haley was saying that argument seems to suggest that, right, she called it, right, feminism as neutrality. And she was very frustrated with that in a social science perspective, thinking how can feminism be neutrality isn't feminism itself already a value-based perspective. So that's the kind of argument I want to be responding to. And I'm just really quickly going to gesture towards this uh, well-accepted work in feminist philosophy of science. Um, so here I have in mind Helen Longino's distinction between constitutive values and contextual values in scientific inquiry. Constitutive values are the epistemic values we're used to thinking of when we think of scientific inquiry. Um, we want our premises to be relevant to our conclusions. We want 
to rule out um, irrelevant variables. Um, uh, they're all the things that are supposed to make an inquiry um, uh, procedurally designed to answer the questions it's, it's setting out to answer. But contextual values are those larger values that structure um, inquiries um, that may be harder to detect their role in how they set up um, the methodologies used to answer particular questions. Um, so, it, and here's an example. So Elizabeth Anderson has this great paper um, about, and the, the citations on the bottom here, um, where she's showing that um, status quo assumptions often play a role in how people conceptualize the objects of inquiry that they're investigating. So she's got this social science example of research about divorce, where the status quo values are that divorce is a bad thing. It's the destruction of a family. And so when you're looking for the impacts of divorce, um, you look for people who are, say, going to therapy or something like that. Whereas the more feminist conception of divorce um, in a different social science study says, yes, divorce can be experienced as a bad thing, but it can sometimes by some people be experienced as a way to put bad things behind us so that we um, have a better future. And there, if we're looking for the impacts of divorce, we're gonna look for positive as well as negative impacts. Anderson's argument there is just that the feminist conception of the object of inquiry, the impacts of divorce, is epistemically fruitful because it opens up better ways to conceptualize where we look for data. And it allows us to see not only one predetermined kind of impact of divorce, but rather um, a more full range of impacts. So it's taking the blinders off to use a more feminist conception of divorce. <clears throat> So if that's true, here's my basic point. If that's true in scientific inquiry, we can make a, a parallel argument um, to feminist values in judging. I'm just gonna really quickly talk about this um, study, again, cited at the bottom of the page by the International Criminal Tribunal for the former Yugoslavia's Office of the Prosecutor. They put together this great book um, in 2016, when the ICTY was about to be, um, you know, doing its work to shut down, um, because they didn't want all the work that they had done to um, develop a gender perspective for prosecuting conflict-related sexual violence to get lost. They didn't want other people to have to reinvent the wheel on this. But what I wanted to emphasize is the epistemic um, advantages that they found to using a specifically gender-based approach to thinking about um, sexual violence in armed conflict. So I've bolded, this is not, the emphasis is not original. <laughs> Opening our minds to the possibility of charging sexual violence as an underlying act of genocide. Um, sorry, this is a little bit obscured on my screen. Helped us to move toward a more accurate approach to the legal definition of this crime. In particular, it helped us to identify misconceptions leading to an overfocus on a killings as a sine qua non of genocide even though the terms of the genocide convention, convention as reflected in the ICTY statute are indisputably broader. So again, taking an explicitly gendered framework helped them get a better understanding of what the law objectively requires. Okay, and so my last slide is just these conclusions. And <laughs> um, again, I wanna refer as um, Andreas did also to the idea that right, not all women are going to be sensitive to gender justice, even when we're thinking of gender justice in this minimalist way. Even explicitly feminist judge, judges may be unclear about how to deploy uh, feminist values legitimately um, in their work. Um, and so my last conclusion is that the issues of normative legitimacy involved in the cases that I think are of most concern in the literature seem to be cases where gender justice is important as an outcome and there, I think it's important to start working towards um, sensitivity to gender justice, um, rather than when we're thinking about normative legitimacy, the number of women on the bench. Even though I think, again, I want to finish with this also, that there are independent arguments, um, as Andreas was sketching, um, that establish the importance of that goal independently of concerns about normative legitimacy. Thanks. Thanks, uh, Kristen. Can you uh, stop your screen share? Great. Yeah. So I can see everyone. Very nice. Very nice. Very interesting. Really uh, opened my mind to a lot of considerations. Uh, so I would like to invite people here to um, ask questions, um, comments, um, suggestions for future research, whatever. 
give you a moment to reflect. Well, I think the lack of comments suggests you all are completely convinced, so that's great. Um, okay, so let's start with Callum, and then I see also uh, Shayla after that. Uh, unmute, of course. Yeah. yeah, I just had a, a question about the um, the data on the panel effects that came in the first third of the presentation, and I don't think that this. If I follow the argument right, I don't think it impacts the the conclusions uh, that that either of you came to. Uh, I was just interested in the answer <laughs> to this question, which is just that: Are those panel effects sensitive to the number of women judges on the bench? So, is it the case that if there's only one woman judge, then it's a small panel effect? But if it's eight or ten out of fifteen, then it's a bigger panel effect, or or is it just sort of a threshold and then it's yeah. Andreas, did you want to answer that? Well, as Krishna knows, my memory is awful, but I do think that the, the significant impact was one woman. So this is actually then a, an argument in favor of the token, right? Where, as again, indicating that the deliberation, the, the opening of minds that carries over from the particular case to later cases, um, uh, is is important in for, for these that was my recollection also of that finding andreas yeah thanks uh, shayla Dov, um thank you both this is this is really interesting interesting work i really uh, appreciated it um, a couple, a couple of questions, and first a comment. It seems to me uh, your argument is really going back and forth between um, issues of procedural justice and, and substantive justice, and you're worried about the epistemic implications of making sort of also independent judgments about the quality of judgment by the courts, right? And there is a tricky issue issue there. You know, how do you code uh, that gender justice has been uh, achieved? Do you yourselves have specific answers to how a case must be judged in order to judge that gender justice in that particular case has been achieved? So let me just add a couple of considerations to, to, to that. I mean, uh, one of the implications of the slide um, study that you showed about the International Criminal Court or Tribunal for Yugoslavia would be the expansion. I don't, I don't understand what my phone is doing today, forgive me. <laughs> but uh, uh, one implication would be to circle back to the very definition of the Genocide Convention, because the Genocide Convention focuses on ethnicity, language, um, religious background, there is absolutely nothing about, about gender there. So this could be a very interesting opening of the argument that you really cannot talk about uh, genocide and, without bringing in gender and gender violence, even if it doesn't just result in specific deaths. So that's, that's one opening. The other is, um, uh, I'll try, in a very important case concerning the scarf affair, right? The European Court of Human Rights is all over the place about this. And most of the time they reject it and they leave it up to the discretion of the courts. Uh, there are quite a few women judges who have expressed themselves on this opinion. And this is also true for the uh, German constitutional court where you have found women on both sides of the argument. So again, I'm coming back, I'm coming back, I guess, to this, to this question. Is it possible to make judgments about the court's judgments without having some conception oneself that is independent of procedure of what the right, the right answer is? And uh, for our case, the scarf affair where women judges are on both sides of the issue is a good is a good indication for this puzzle, and but I really appreciated uh, the presentation. Thank you. Yeah, Andres, is it okay if I jump in? 
Sure. Um, and Sheila, uh, is, you're talking about veiling issues when you're talking about scarf, yeah. And veiling in public and the cases in Switzerland and France and yeah, okay. Um, so I think that's a really important question. I'm not gonna have an adequate answer, <laughs> um, but I think um, that I was pointing to the study by the Office of the Prosecutor for the Yugoslav Tribunal, partly because I think it's important, and I'm gonna sort of go in the opposite direction and try to lean more on procedure than substance. Because part of their point is that the work that they did, they're presenting as important because they institutionalized uh, what they're calling a gender perspective, where the gender perspective uh, takes into account this idea that there are structural uh, features of societies that um, marginalize women's voices and uh, make it harder for, broadly speaking, gender justice to be realized in courts. But so their solution is not to say we need to decide X, Y, and Z in these kinds of cases, but rather we need prosecutors um, to be sensitive to how they're structuring investigations. We need to make sure that um, investigative teams have gender advisors. We need to um, do education for judges when that's necessary. And then, <laughs> right, the idea is it's not an issue of who decides what. It's rather this idea that the systemic biases that were already there have been consciously and intentionally at least mitigated by the procedures that the um, Office of the Prosecutor has now institutionalized and made regular, no matter who's there. So really early on, so in the Akiesu case uh, at the ICTR, there was a lot of influence on who, who's actually going out and talking to survivors. Is, are they male or female? If they're male, do they have uh, a woman with them. And then there was this uh, you know, other issue of, uh, are they just people from you know, the United States or Europe somewhere, or are we working with actual Rwandan women's groups who are already mobilized, right? So who was doing the investigations really mattered, but that was the case partly because there was no systemic <laughs> institutionalized way to recognize these concerns and make sure that the institution was responding to them um, in a systematic kind of way. Once that's in place, the idea is the representation of who's there matters less. And that's like slightly orthogonal to your question about the decision. Do we need to really assess whether a decision was consistent with gender justice, we need a substantive outcome. But I'm sort of trying to <laughs> pull away from that. And I'm wondering if you think that that's that's just never going to get me to where I want to be, or do you think that might be promising? Uh, we'll open it, but thank you. I mean, I, it is this it, it, very difficult balance between procedural yeah. and substantive justice, and I do appreciate, I do appreciate, you know, the sort of the way you're trying to, the way you are trying to balance this. There is no question in my mind that if these procedures are implemented, and if Andreas's example is that, that there is going to be some kind of uh, qualitative change in the decision, right. but where exactly that decision goes and how it can go, that itself is, you know, remains, remains open and maybe it should. Uh, Andreas wants to add or... Well, just, just to, uh, to underscore this, so to supplement uh, Kristen on one point, I think we might make it some uh, some benefits in terms of measure, assessing the quality of the procedures. Um, if there's an agreement that some of the experts have now reached a more comprehensive account of the relevant legal norms and so forth, so that there's there'll be agreement that this is a procedure that now better, better matches the ideals of, 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 judge, of judgeship. Um, but again, we uh, we see these gendered effects in, in all sorts of interesting ways. Uh, there's some draft uh, studies showing uh, that women on the European Court of Human Rights statistically tend to be less favorable for monetary compensation mm -hmm. for women victims 
um, of, of violence. Uh, and the, one hypothesis is that some of these women, more than men, see some kind of uh, the victim is to blame aspects of, of, of some of these. Uh, again, underscoring that it's not the, the, this, this, this epistemic argument is very different from the representational um, sorts of concerns. Uh, okay, we have a question from Yanis. Yes. Thank you, thank you. This is uh, very, very, very thought provoking. Um, I have, I, I want to pick up. I, I have several issues to, to uh, bones to, to to pick with you. However, I want to, I want to start with the last point and Kristen's mentioning of uh, groups like educating judges. To me, that's an absolute faux pas because uh, Wall Street firms have been trying to do that uh, post. 2000 crisis, they try to educate judges on how to think about financial, for example, uh, how adjudicating cases of financial nature and claiming that judges do not have the expertise per se to, us, to adjudicate these cases. And now uh, it's a similar thing you say here that all oh, male judges and, and sometimes female judges do not have the awareness to, uh, to adjudicate objectively on some cases, they are not educated enough. And, 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 and I think that's, that, that, that's very dangerous uh, because judges should not, in, in other words, the, judge, the, the judges, like the outcome should, should be the same, regardless who the judge is and what their educational background is or awareness of a certain issue is. Now, of course, judges can, have, can be partial, they're human beings, but we have a way of remedying that by having different levels. We have appellate courts. And we have the Supreme, we have different levels of to actually minimize the effect of the partiality of judges. Okay. However, the danger I see here is we are trying to influence all judges to think a certain way with respect to a certain issue, and that's actually tainting justice um, irreparably. Do, do, do you share that concern, or do you um, what? What do you say on the, on that uh, on, on on that issue on the objectivity of justice? Yeah, yeah, I, I totally see where you're coming from, and I think uh, I, as a general rule, I share your worry about that. And so, if private groups are running, uh, you know, um, educational opportunities for influential judges at um, fancy resorts <laughs> um, uh, funded by, you know, dark money or something like that. Yeah, I'm super worried about that. But I think the comment of mine that you're picking up on was actually uh, what I was reporting about the Office of the Prosecutor um, from the um, ICTY. And I think what they're talking about in terms of educating judges is very different. Um, so they're talking about when they bring their cases, um, they need to be accepting a burden of proof in the courtroom. Um, and that's a completely, right? That's not a back channel or anything. So uh, I, I, I think maybe you, you, you heard what I was saying slightly out of context. Does that sound fair? Yes, if, if it's the education is based on legally, like the, the, the legal logic or the, what's the legal standard, then, then that's, right. that, yeah. that, that's fine. What, what I don't want is my idiosyncratic views sure. on issues which are not related to, 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 to how the, the justice system should work yep. as, a, as a logical system, as a, as a system of making inferences based on argument and facts. You know, if you yeah. are not trying to influence that, then 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 that's fine. Yeah. And and, th and th thank you for for clarifying. We're on the same page, yeah. <laughs> thank you, uh, Andreas. Well, if I could just uh, add some some reflections uh, to this, that um, so we agree that there are risks with educating judges, uh, but there are also risks of not educating judges, right? And there's um, um, and so what what uh, what this panel effect seems to indicate is that there's actually some learning among the judges when they when they discuss in chambers and so from that point of view what uh, kirsten and i are are supporting are arguments of saying that by having a more 
um, uh, more women judges, more relevant legal standards are going to be brought into these deliberations, it seems. Not, not foolproof, da, 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 but it's, uh, it's, and so that's, that's completely um, sticking to the law issues. And then the second point, um, uh, there is of course a risk that any feminist judge is bringing idiosyncratic views and legal, weird legal philosophies into the chambers. But that's not a new risk with women, right? This is the, the risk here is always that the, the lawyers will be, the judges will be coming in with their own idiosyncratic views about law, about how to interpret. Um, and so it's important to, to control for this and to control for this by, by as many means as possible. So that would be another mode of learning a third i have four a four a, a third form of learning that's I, that i find fascinating is uh, again picking up on the feminist judges that that christian and i agree we need to have more of it seems it seems there are some studies of the us judiciary that there are some men who seem to be at least as feminist in their judging as the women judges and it seems male judges who have daughters are more likely to issue judgment. Does that make them less objective? Does, or does that open their eyes to some of the le relevant legal norms? And again, if you want the, the, the case of, of someone bringing expensive law firms to teach judges, the reverse is what has happened, I know, in, in Nepal. When the law changes, uh, middle-aged judges need to learn. So in Nepal, women law, lawyers groups have been teaching the middle-aged judges about Nepali new obligations under the Convention Against Discrimination of Women that, that Nepal signed up to, and that the judges, of course, never, no, never learned in law school. Somebody has to do it. And, and uh, if, if nobody else, then why not ask those who want? And I would just add in defense of your position against one other thing that Yanis mentioned, it, it wouldn't suffice to rely on appellate judges or higher levels of, of courts to remedy problems of partiality at lower levels if they also didn't include this kinds of representation that you've been arguing for, epistemologically speaking. So I just don't think that relying on this uh, appellate system answers the, is sufficient. Uh, but that's just my two cents in defense of the argument. Patricia had a question, Patty. Thanks. Um, thank you for your talk. I have a lot of things to think about now. Uh, also, I hope you can hear me. Yes. Um, yes good because my internet connection is unstable. I just got a message. I just have a quick question because I'm really curious about these panel effects that you all brought up. And I think that's just one of the most fascinating kind of things to study and think about why it is that how norms change within a group and how uh, sensitivity to certain forms of information and perspective um, can shift um, given who you're interacting with and who is on the team that is evaluating a certain set of information. And so I'm wondering, one, if you all have anything to say about the mechanisms that um, come into play to explain these panel effects, um, what kind of, I don't know, um, social expectations, how those change um, and things like that. And two, I'm wondering if you all have uh, any information or, or know about these panel effects when it comes to um, other kinds of marginalized communities being um, included or members of different marginalized groups being included in um, a group of judges. So when it comes to race or ability disability or LGBTQ, um, does this also come up em empirically in the studies that y'all have seen um, with other groups? Um, so I'll, I'll jump in a little bit um, uh, on the second question. Um, and again, I don't know of a lot of that research um, internationally, but for US courts, 
there's been a bunch of research on um, the race of judges and the perspective that racial identity brings um, in deliberation and also the kinds of issues facing um, people at various or sitting at various social intersections um, in actually right, the appointment and selection and education process. Um, I could send you some of those citations. I don't have off the head, except my, the top of my head, the specific information about how panel effects work there, but I bet within that literature, there's, there's um, interesting stuff there. Andres, did you want to? No, this is, I'm, we're, I'm putting on the, uh, on the blog, um, uh, some references. Okay, okay. On, on this. Right, uh, Lauren. Hi, um, thank you so much. Um, so I had a question about um, the anti-essentialist stipulation like at the beginning of the presentation. Um, I My concern is that it seems like there needs to be some kind of functional definition of women um, in order to make it clear like how um, you're analyzing these statistics. And I think that you could avoid essentialism by providing a functional definition and say, instead of saying like, this is what women are, like this is just how we're defining women for the purposes of this, um, this project. Um, and I think that would be useful because otherwise there's just like this implication that you're, um, what women are is just like cisgender women um, or maybe some, conflation of sex and gender, depending on which way you look at it, um, which, or maybe both. Um, so I think just like, uh, I, I guess I'm worried that just like trying not to state it, which I understand that goal, um, ends up just like implying just like some worrisome assumptions about the, the definition of woman. Um, I think that also like relating to the stipulation that you're focusing on the most common genders, I think that that could be phrased in a way that doesn't imply that you're just looking at like the majority or more dominant gender groups, um, which is how it sounded, to me, even though that's not, maybe not what you meant. I don't know, maybe it is um, because, I mean, I don't know if there's trans and gender variant judges on the international court or research on them. Um, but yeah, I think that's just another area where I think like not stating what you meant ended up just like having implications about um, just like w focusing on the dominant group as opposed to like other marginalized gender communities that might re be relevant, but might also not be relevant for various reasons. I think you could just say why those aren't relevant if they're not. Interesting. Kristen. Um, I, yeah, I just wanted to say thank you for that. Um, it's both an important point about how we were using that language and a really constructive point uh, in terms of the functional definition. So I, I just wanted to thank you. Oops, uh, we have a latecomer. <laughs> Somebody's just joining us. Uh, Susan, hi. Um, did you have any, uh, Andreas, any response to that? No, I, th I think you're, I very much agree with you. Um, the, the, our, at least my reason for focusing on this particular issue is that the question of whether parity is required has been focusing on these two uh, numerically m apparently most common uh, genders. And some, again, um, going uh, to a broader understanding of sexuality would be an important further research topic. Uh, do we, for instance, do we see the panel effects um, in this sense? Um, is, there, is there more of an identity uh, recognition, representation? Uh, is there more awareness of minorities in general if you belong to one of the sort of more popularly focused minorities now and so on? There's, there's a lot of important work to be done. Yeah, Lauren. Mm -hmm. um, I just had a quick follow. I guess I'm not concerned. My point, I guess, wasn't about minoritized sexuality groups, though that could be relevant. Um, just minoritized gender groups besides women. Um, and I think that like, if you're focusing on things like equity and justice, um, in like other cases besides gender, only focusing on the dominant groups would raise concern if we're talking about justice and equity. Like if we're talking about like disability, then only focusing on the most prevalent groups 
would be like the able-bodied people. So I guess that that was the concern that I had um, just specific to gender, um, but I just want to clarify. Yeah, yep. but I, I see what you mean. Yep. Uh, Kristen, could I just ask you to elaborate a little bit your list, of, which you didn't read, of arguments for uh, increasing representation of women yeah. uh, was longer and a little different from Andreas. Uh, his, his arguments I, I found compelling. What would you add to his list or what, uh, what were some of the other sort of standard arguments or how do you see how do you see your list relating to Andreas's threefold elements of compassion, epistemic, uh, considerate deliberation, and status inequality? I, so I think uh, my list was sort of different, but was largely I um, focusing on what, what Andreas was talking about under the heading of status equality, um, and so. I had equal opportunity overcoming bias, moving towards meritocratic hiring um, and combating, I, had, I mean, broadly speaking, pipeline issues. So social factors that might disadvantage women's legal careers. Those to me are sort of interlocking sort of structural issues that I, I see them as um, broadly falling under the heading of, um, of um, Status equality. Yes, status equality as, as or it's status and equality. Yeah. Yeah. We're remedying it. Yeah. So my list was longer, but not because I was adding different stuff, really. <laughs> just sort of breaking out one of those categories. Yeah. And just to and, and just to underscore the, the list I use is basically uh, sort of second degree plagiarism, right? Because I've been just I've been looking through the the, the very learned contributions onto this field, and then try to some structure them for my purpose, namely, namely, what are the implications for where on this parity scale we should be going? So it's a lump, it's a lumping of different sort of arguments that, that have been made by very thoughtful um, authors. Yeah, I, I liked your uh, arguments. I just, the only thing is you were a little defensive about it all and I would rather eliminate that defensiveness. That's the only minor critique I would make. It's, you know, okay. Uh, Janis wants an, uh, one more uh, question or point or? Yeah, th this is a very, uh, and I really like uh, Lauren's uh, question and then how we went to the to the to the to the subject of should we broaden the spectrum of the selectivity criteria and i want to push it further if we broaden it objectively enough then we're gonna go back into the circle back to judging an individual as an individual without these 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 these, these categories like including the categories in an objective way would make us actually to look the individual as a whole as, as a holistic human being and and then that would negate the need to to to, to nuance the different categories so it's kind of like it will negate itself that's that's the inference i'm trying to make like if you include gender if you include sexual orientation if you look at educational background if you look socioeconomic status if you start adding all these nuances which are great and show the, the richness of humanity, then you would go back to assessing a human being as a human being devoid of its uh, specific intrinsic uh, qualities. So, so that's, that's, that's the question I'm raising. Uh, I would just recommend that you um, consider s seriously some of the accounts of group oppression. Uh, and I think the argument is that, um, for example, Anne Cudd's book on oppression is very helpful in that regard. Uh, and in that sense, uh, the focus is uh, legitimately, uh, one would argue, on groups that have uh, historically and socially been disadvantaged by oppression. And not so these are not simply designators of characteristics of people such that, of course, the goal is ultimately uh, a society in which uh, all oppression has been eliminated, in which we can uh, appreciate, the, uh, which we have to do anyway for other reasons, the full richness of each individual's personality and character. Uh, but uh, as a way to get there, um, the, the reality is that women uh, have been, are one of the groups that have been historically discriminated against and 
some of us would argue oppressed and therefore uh, have been excluded from processes of the constitution of these courts and their deliberations. So I think I just wanted to make a more forceful argument in that direction. But I don't know if anyone else wanted to address his challenge, judging from his contribution to the chat over the um, okay, well, in that case, um, are there other questions or comments? I think that's been fantastic. I'm hoping somebody else wants to, uh, yes, uh, TM Ottavino. Hi, um, I came in late, but I just wanted to say that um, the slide that um, mentioned the sort of impact of the the sort of visualization of this and how it how it impacts um like when we see a, a when we see mostly male judges for example it says so much and and as a person who works in the media i just think that that is something that um is so important to be bringing up as part of this argument because it really does um, affect how we choose judges in the future, how we choose anything in the future, and the capacities that we think people have for um, filling positions. So I appreciated that um, aspect of it. Yeah, I think, I, so there's this way of referring to this as like a role model model <laughs> of why this matters, where role models might sound trivial, but for all the reasons you're talking about, they can actually be instrumental in bringing about social change. Um, for, so um, Obama for in a judicial context was talking specifically about having, you know, folks being able to recognize people who look like them um, in positions of authority and in um, judicial positions in particular. And this habituates people to see um, all sorts of different people as potential bearers of authority and um, that is not just, you know, a role model in a trivial sense. That's that's a, a significant sense. So if, if I totally agree. Yeah. So one of the things I thought was very intri intriguing when I was preparing my own contribution here was exactly to try to unpack this representation, role modeling, um, the this expressive role. Uh, of of that of that of uh, of a court or the, the the public appearance to sort of um, because it is sometimes dismissed too far too quickly um, and I do think it really has these very important values so partly instrumentally I think Carol and I have discussed before the value of role models in academia right to to sort of to open people's minds that these are paths that are possible for them too right this is extremely important. But then in addition to the instrumental role, somehow there's something about how we as a society signal what is valuable or what is not valuable. Again, perhaps Carol will have another panel sometime on the on the on the tearing down of statues. Uh, what's uh, the, oh. the, 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 the political theory of statue building and tearing down? I think that book is waiting to be written. I have a student uh, from our critical social theory course who just wrote a fantastic paper on that topic. Patty was in that class with me. Can uh, I throw in one, one aspect of that? My, my yeah. friend who's a law professor uh, um, has been arguing that tearing down statues um, could itself be a new kind of memorial, right? So a memorial, let, let the wreckage of the old statues stand with plaques with the date of when it was torn down and leave it <laughs> as a new kind of memorial. And I, I, I really find myself just taken with that idea. But Jefferson had this interesting argument, right? That the constitution would need to be agreed every 19 years to sort of bind the new generations. What if, you ha what if statues had this expiration date, right? And unless there was a majority um, it got torn down, or it would somehow it would self demolish after 19 years, unless enough people would press their thumbs or something. You could have a nice app for this. I think, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh dear. Uh, it's interesting. Um, anyone else? <laughs> 
Well, on that note of self-imploding statues, we <laughs> with a touch of a collective button, uh, we will um, thank uh, Kristen and Andreas for a fantastically stimulating session. It was really great. Thank you so much.